Thrilled to announce leading your Series B. We were very fortunate to first invest in you 12 years ago when you were a PhD student starting Kencho and excited to partner again on Open Evidence. First off, let me say uh, there's a long history with Google and uh, Google wrote me my first ever check many years ago when I was a student. And I, at the time, I had no track record. I hadn't sold Kencho. I got connected with uh, with Google and with GV, and uh, they ended up being the first institutional investor in Kensho, and backed my first uh, my first company out of school, out of Harvard, and um, it's been uh, it's been a joy ever since. As a starting point, why don't you provide an overview on what the company does? Open Evidence is an app that you can download from the App Store or use on the web that allows clinicians in the United States to make high stakes clinical and treatment decisions at the point of care. It's free for healthcare professionals in the United States. They just need to register and log in with their healthcare credentials. Our users use it every day on average to make very high stakes treatment decisions by asking natural language questions, uh, either through typing or even verbally by having a verbal conversation with the app. And what makes it so special and very different is that it's built from the ground up for doctors. So it's trained on and it uses the highest quality clinical peer-reviewed evidence from the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association and these high quality sources which are always sourced and cited and in, in, in the references allow the the answers that come out as responses to the doctor questions to always be grounded in evidence and in the highest quality peer-reviewed evidence hence the name open evidence we've reached about a third of doctors in the United States in about a year who are using it on average daily and in part that's a testament to how uh, rapidly AI is being adopted uh, horizontally across the industries, not just medicine, but law and others that I know that you're involved in some of these other companies and other industries. But in medicine, what's very different about it is that the stakes are extremely high, right? This is life and death. Uh, this isn't just productivity or enhancing productivity. That's important. But these are life or life and death decisions that our users are making with the with the platform. So it has to be perfect. One of my uh, favorite things is we have an email thread where we're getting real time feedback from the doctors about how much time they're being saved and how it's leading to better patient outcomes. Why don't you share you know some of those data points and and some of the real time feedback you're getting from physicians every day? So I th I think to to understand that or to quantify that benefit, you first need to take a step back and appreciate how difficult the life of being a doctor is, right? The experience of being a doctor today is nothing short of information overload. It's just straight information overload. That profession has arguably the highest rate of burnout of any profession. And so if you can help tr doctors triage that information overload, if you can use computer systems to allow a doctor to have a personal private army of PhD level research assistants that whenever they have a question, they can speak to a computer system as if it were a PhD research assistant. That's why open evidence has been so successful because it actually solves a real world problem, which is information overload in medicine. And it solves that problem by helping doctors triage that medical information fire hose. And then you can quantify the benefit in two ways that are related, but are orthogonal to one another. One is just the speed and the time savings of finding the relevant uh, medical information. So that's one dimension. But the other dimension, of course, is just the quality of care and the increased quality of care that's delivered by having a computer system act as a brain extender. You mentioned JAMA, and we just announced a, a very important partnership with them. Can you talk about the sources that we use at Open Evidence, but even more importantly, why they trust us? We announced a couple months ago uh, a strategic content agreement with the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which has already been live for some time uh, in open evidence, which gives users of open evidence access to all the multimedia, the figure one, the table one, the types of things that would really help a, a professional, medical professional, understand not just the high level conclusions of a study, but what was the population? Was it a multi-center? Was it uh, focused on one region of the United States? How diverse was the population studied? Is it applicable? to the patient that I'm seeing, what was the control? You know, was it placebo control? All of those details, which would not be captured in a in just the high level conclusions that might be on the public internet, our users now have, have for some time had the benefit of from the New England Journal of Medicine. And we've since now added 
uh, the journals of the American Medical Association. So that's the Journal of the American Medical Association, but it's also JAMA Oncology, JAMA Neurology, the 13 big specialty journals. And in terms of why us, you know, I can't speak for them. What I do know and what I can say is that in both of those cases, many of their users and members were very active open evidence users. Half of the GV team, as you know, is technologists focused on AI, but the other half is focused on life sciences, and that team is predominantly made up of physicians and scientists. And we had a very natural interaction with open evidence where they heard about it, they began to use it, they came back and said, wow, these answers are far better than other places where we're testing that leverage AI. They came back a second time and said, we're using this all the time now. But you did this fascinating thing, which is you went direct to the doctors. You removed all friction to adopt the product. Why did you decide to go that route? What led you to that decision? Yeah, we took a very unconventional approach, which is DTC, which in our case means direct to clinician. My philosophy from day one has been that doctors are people, doctors are consumers, and you can appeal to them like people, like humans, and like consumers. And if you create something amazing, I just use the same formula that made Instagram work and TikTok work and Facebook in its day work and Google in its day work. If you put it on the Apple App Store and the uh, Google Play uh, the Android store. And we said, you can download it and you can use it. And if you like it, use it. And if you don't like it, don't use it. And um, that turned out to be just lightning in a bottle because for the first time ever, really, I would say ever, the half of the country that wasn't in San Francisco and the doctors in that part of the, in those parts of the country felt like somebody made something for them and that appealed to them regardless of whether they didn't have a CMIO in their practice. We mentioned your, your history with GV predates mine, right, with Kensho 12 years ago almost. You had this amazing, extremely successful exit. You were very young in an extremely hard industry with financial services. What sort of compelled you to get back in the arena again and to do it in, a, in an even harder, more regulated industry with, with healthcare? I did take a few years off because I was burnt out. Most notably, uh, COVID hit and it focused my mind on medicine as it did everyone in the world. And that, so I was very familiar with the pain points and the burnout and the information overload of being a really high stakes, high, high flying knowledge worker. And that's exactly what doctors are. And so the framing of the problem felt very familiar to me, even though the industry was different. COVID focused my attention on medicine and healthcare. And the nice thing about a second company is you can really focus, you obviously want to create an enormously successful business commercially, and we will do that, and we are doing that. But you can also focus on impact. You're a academic by training, but I yes. think one of the rare special skills you have is you're extremely commercial, right? You're very good at sales, marketing, but I, I know a superpower you're proud of is recruiting. I think for you, that's also important and something you point to as success. What's the key to finding that talent, recruiting them, or also something I see you do every day, which is like pushing them to be better? A lot of the things that I did right with Kensho have now become consensus. And so I don't think they will hit as strangely as they did at the time. But at the time, the consensus was you want to find people with X years of experience doing exactly the thing that you want them to do. So if they were a machine learning engineer, and this is all very early in machine, like this is 2013, right? If you want to find someone who could do that, you would, you know, find someone from usually like the very narrow group of people in the world who had been doing that for a few years and try to recruit them away. And so these people came from backgrounds that had nothing whatsoever to do with what I wanted them to work on. And there was nothing about their resumes that would have fit into the conventional mold of, you know, they have X years of experience, so hire them for this thing. Um, but what was clear then, and of course it's very clear now, but it was clear then is that these were very high IQ people. They're not necessarily super experienced in any one thing, but they're very good at learning rapidly and deeply and profoundly 
understanding what they're learning and and applying it. And so that's been my my approach to to spotting talent. And then in terms of cultivating it, that's quite unconventional to this day. I run an extremely flat organization. There's almost no hierarchy of any kind. I'm serving a third of American doctors on average daily with two dozen people. That's, that's, an, that's a remarkable fact, but it's a testament to just what the outer limits are of human productivity if you put incredibly elite people together with other incredibly elite people and give them an enormous amount of uh, autonomy and put them in a relatively flat organization. 15, 20 years from now, what do you want open evidence to be? Where are we headed? In the near future, um, medical superintelligence won't wait for you to ask the question. A change could be a change in the literature. So you've always done something in a given way. But just this morning, there was a phase three RCT published in JAMA Oncology that found that a new treatment has superior efficacy and a better, better safety profile than what you've always done. It will just know that about you, know that that's what you typically like to use in this context, and then prompt you with that updated information. Another change might be a change in, in your patient, right? It might be that certain uh, lab results uh, change or certain biometrics change, blood pressure drops, whatever the case may be. And it won't wait to connect that fact to the medical literature or to other patient case studies. Even that is going to seem like an early chapter compared to the near future. It's not 25 years, it's in the next year or two where this medical intelligence is going to be embedded and enmeshed ambiently in all of the context that exists around a patient and around a doctor and around a healthcare setting. 